Don't you love it when science and alcohol get together? <laughs> All right, so uh, Charles Darwin, uh, very interesting guy, wonderful guy, genius, but he was really uptight. Okay, Sex at Dawn, the original, when we pitched the book Sex at Dawn, the original title was What Darwin Didn't Know About Sex. Uh, because he, he married when he was almost 30. Uh, by all accounts, he had never had sex with anyone uh, until he married his wife, who was Emma Wedgwood from the Wedgwood China family, and she was a famous prude. Um, <laughs> When Darwin was going around the world in the Beagle, he went through the South Pacific, Tahiti, all these amazing, beautiful, tropical places with really hot, open-minded women, and he stayed on the damn boat, right? Everybody else was down on the island having a good time. Darwin stayed on the boat with his insect collection. Um, okay, but I want to start by admitting right up front, I've got bias, just like everybody's got bias, okay? Anyone who tells you they don't have bias is full of shit. Avoid them. So this is how Cannon sees wildlife, and this is how I see it. Uh, so let's just get that out on the table. I don't, it's always been that way. I've got a friend here, Mark, who I went to high school with. He can tell you I saw wildlife this way in 1980. Um, <laughs> I'm not saying this, all right? Uh, now, those of you who have read Sex at Dawn know that there's no advice, there's no advocacy, it's not a prescriptive book, we're not telling anyone what to do with the information that we offer, we're just saying, look, this is the data, this is the way it looks to us, this is what it seems to mean about our ancestors, but as I've, some of you have probably heard me say before, Arguing uh, that human beings are not naturally monogamous is not saying there's anything wrong with monogamy. Humans are not naturally vegetarians either, but some of my best friends are vegetarians. I kind of wish I were a vegetarian. I, I was for three years, but then I went to Mexico. Very hard to be a vegetarian in Mexico. Um, but the point is, if you want to be a vegetarian, don't expect that bacon will suddenly stop smelling good, right? <laughs> understand what you're doing is against your nature. Okay? So, the, in the book, those of you who've read the book, there's the line in there that says, a fig leaf can hide many things, but a human erection isn't one of them. <laughs> I sent that to my dad. My dad's sort of my editor. And my, by, my parents, by the way, have been married monogamously, as far as I know, for 52 years, right? Yeah. Uh, but my dad read that line and I said, do you think that's a little too much? And he said, fuck no, leave it in there. <laughs> so the standard narrative, which, which we all know, it posits that human nature from the beginning of time has had women trading fidelity to men for their support, for meat, status, protection, shelter, whatever, right? And because the women are vulnerable, they need a man to stick around and take care of them. So that's the deal. And the man won't stick around to take care of the woman and her child or children unless he's got a very uh, good sense that that child is his, genetically speaking, right? Otherwise, why would he invest all his resources in this child? So it sort of presupposes that men and women are locked in this eternal struggle of misery because we've got conflicting reproductive agendas. Right? So that's the basic standard narrative of human sexual evolution. Um, Darwin is responsible for a lot of that. He was the guy who said women are very, you know, coy and they're not really interested in sex. That's his wife. Um, <laughs> but he was perplexed and interested by the hinder ends of adjoining of certain monkeys, and specifically apes, who have these big sexual swellings, right? Um, now here you can see the sexual swellings. He was confused by this because if the female's got sexual swellings, that means she's attracting the attention, she's, she's provoking the sexual attention of not just one male, but lots of males. Why would she do that? Doesn't make any sense according to the standard narrative. So that was the one thing Darwin could never quite figure out. Why the hell is this happening? Um, 
What we're saying is that it's to provoke sperm competition. Sperm competition is in species where the female typically has sex with more than one male in any given ovulatory cycle. The sperm cells compete to see who's going to fer fertilize the ovum, not the individual males. So that allows the males, more males, to live together peacefully without fighting over women all the time. Now it turns out of the hundreds of species of primate in the world, many of which live in large complex social groups with multiple males, do you know how many of them are sexually monogamous? Zero, unless you think we're the one exception, right? The most social of all primates, that we're the exception somehow. Okay, so there's your sperm competition. Now, people who argue against sperm competition have a pretty tough uh, row to hoe because all sperm is competitive. A uh, typical human male ejaculate can, contains about 300 million sperm cells. One of them might get to the ovum. Right? So it's always a competitive situation. And all the, my wife and I, Casilda is my co-author, by the way, who's my wife. She's not here, unfortunately. Um, what we're arguing is that it's not just the sperm from one man that, that are in competition, it's the sperm from many men that are in competition. And there's a great deal of, of evidence that obviously I won't have time to get into tonight, but there's anatomical evidence, as you can see with different apes. These are the six apes. So which, there's a lot of information on this chart. I'm not a very good chart maker. This is the only chart I've ever made that I actually like. <laughs> but you can see, uh, in a species like gorillas, the male's about twice the size of the female. Gorillas are harem-based breeders. So the males fight. The one male that ends up winning kicks all the other males out. He's the silverback. So there's only one adult dominant male. He controls all the females, and he's the only male that has sex with those females. So what happens? The males evolve to be bigger and bigger and stronger and stronger because the biggest, strongest one is the one who generally wins, so his genes get passed along. But because he's the only one who's screwing any of those females, he ends up with a penis the size of your pinky finger. 300 pound, gorilla has a penis this big, and his testicles are the size of kidney beans. <laughs> but he's twice the size of the females, right? Whereas with the promiscuous breeders, the humans, the bonobos, and the chimp, males are about 25% bigger than the females in all cases. And in the monogamous gibbon, they're exactly the same size. Very hard to tell a female from the male. So there are very clear anatomical indications. Another one is you can see the testicles and the gorilla, orangutan, and gibbon are internal. They're in the abdomen, right? Because they're fighting all the time. It makes sense. Having external testicles, as any man will tell you, is a dangerous endeavor. <laughs> it's not only dangerous, but the reason we have external testicles is to keep them cool and preserve them longer. And that's because we want to be prepared to have several ejaculations in rapid succession. In the book, I say, Having external testicles is like having a, an extra fridge in the garage just for beer, <laughs> right? If you're a guy who has a fridge, a beer fridge, you expect a party to break out at any time. <laughs> so there you have it. Now the numbers in there are the number, uh, the ratio of sex acts to birth. Human beings have sex about a thousand times per birth. <laughs> If that number seems high to some of you, don't worry, to some others it seems low. Uh, it, it, it averages out. Um, but most mammals only have sex when the female's ovulating. So they have sex about 15 times per birth, as in gorillas, orangutans, and gibbons. Same thing with most mammals. Um, it's very unusual, biologically speaking, for a female to be willing and even eager to have sex when she's menstruating, when she's already pregnant, when she's postmenopausal. I won't get into all the different types of sex we have that can't possibly lead to pregnancy. That's very unusual, right? Um, so the human, just the, the sheer force of the human libido is another indication of sperm competition. Uh, also, you see that the bonobos and the humans are the only animals that have sex face to face. It's a very interesting trait. Um, now, uh. 
As you can see here, the Italian falls closer to the bonobo in terms of testicular volume. Uh, he's a friend of mine. I, I took that picture in, in Goa, India, and, uh, and I started using it in presentations. You know, <laughs> just because he's got such a package there, and he's wearing this silly little bikini thing that they wear, these Italian guys wear in, in Goa. And uh, I thought, he'll never know, you know. And then I did, a, I did a thing in Sydney, at the Sydney Opera House, and it got put on the internet, and I get an email from India saying, hey! Uh, his name is Viram, and I've got his email for anyone who wants to get in touch. Very nice guy. Uh, and the gorilla, I took that picture on a very warm day in Holland, warm spring day, so that's as testicular as that gorilla is ever going to get, okay? That is a relaxing spring day, and the bonobo you can see. Bonobo testicles are the size of chicken eggs. Uh, yeah, and I've already said the kidney beans. So those are the two extremes of the primate testicular ratio. Now humans, our, our testicles aren't as big as the bonobos and the chimps, but our penis, luckily, is, takes the cake. Can a, can a penis take cake? I'm not sure. It's a, it's a weird image, sorry, sorry. Uh, we have the, the, arguably the longest penis, maybe tied with the, the bonobo, but definitely the thickest penis. And the flared head is very interesting, very unusual. The chimp and the bonobo penis are sort of long conical things, and they just go in, ejaculate, and come out. It takes about six seconds, literally. So, you know, men who are, you know, last 25 seconds, you're breaking, you're, that's a primate record, all right? Let's hear it for the minute men. Um, but uh, the flared head and the repeated thrusting action of human uh, intercourse is very interesting because what happens is with that flared head, it creates a vacuum in the woman's reproductive tract that pulls back any sperm that's already in there, right? Dan Savage calls this the plunger penis theory. Um, yeah, so, so these are all anatomical indications of sperm competition in our evolutionary past, right? Uh, now, there are also, there's also evidence from anthropology. There are all sorts of cases brought back by explorers, anthropologists, even missionaries, much to their chagrin, of societies that don't give a damn about paternity, okay? There's a case of uh, a Jesuit priest uh, missionary who was in uh, Canada up around Lake Huron in the 1700s. He was chastising one of the Indians for letting their women have sex with whomever they want. And he said, you know, how do you know whose child belongs to whom? And the Indian said to him, you French are very strange. You only love your own children. We love all the children. Right? Now, now what we're doing in science often is what Casilda and I call Flintstoneization which is when you look around at your world and you say, okay, we all live in nuclear families, we all hoard property, we all you know, do whatever, we have these political hierarchies and so on, and then you project that into prehistory as a way of explaining, sort of, but really justifying your world, right? And we all do it. That's why I start with the bias thing. We all do it. Joseph Campbell, the great mythologist, said the first step toward wisdom is to demythologize, detribalize yourself to recognize that you come from a tribe and recognize the belief structure of that tribe and try to get beyond it, right? So that's what we're trying to do in the book. This is a very interesting cultural context. These are the Mosuo people of uh, southwest China who live in the, in the Himalayan foothills. Now in their society, when a girl reaches sexual maturity, she gets her own bedroom. It's called a flower room. It's got a door that opens into the central courtyard of the house, and it also has a door that opens into the street. This girl can have anyone she wants spend the night in her room with her. It can be a different guy every night. It can be three guys in one night. It, whatever she wants, it's her business. Nobody else's business. The only rule is that nobody can be there for breakfast. <laughs> right? So you wonder, what happens when, uh, when she gets pregnant? The paternal responsibility for her child falls to her brothers. The biological father has no importance whatsoever. 
All right? So that's a counterexample. This is a woman from the Pinaha people in the Amazon who believe in something called partable paternity, which means that several different men can be fathers simultaneously of the same child. They believe that a fetus is made of accumulated semen. So a woman who wants to have a kid who's smart and funny and good looking will have sex with the smart guy, the funny guy, and the good looking guy and get all the essence of these guys into her baby. Now, the point I'm trying to make and that E.O. Wilson makes here is that human sexuality is not primarily about making babies. It's primarily about bonding. It's primarily about establishing intimate connections. Once we understand that, then we hopefully will have greater respect for same-sex unions and for all sorts of different relationships that fall outside of what we consider to be standard and, and normal in our society. So the only prescriptive message in our book is toward greater compassion for each other and understanding. Thank you. Woo!